So, je suis Michel Côté, c'est moi qui vais avoir l'honneur aujourd'hui de présenter notre conférencier um, ainsi que de gérer la présentation d'aujourd'hui. Uh, I will do it in English for the benefit of most people. Um, so, today we have the uh, pleasure to have uh, a colleague from the University of Montreal, uh, William Witsak Krampa, qui est un colleague next door, but we see each other through Zoom. Um, so, William accepted to give his talk on a recent paper that he um, published, and we were intrigued by this, uh, the study that he's done. So, it's concerning the universal shape of fluctuation. So, something that was published. I think in the nature communication. So we thought that would be a good idea that he talked to us about this uh, subject. Uh, let me tell you first about uh, William uh, Pat. Uh, so actually William studied as an undergrad at McGill University. Um, and then afterward continued to do his PhD at the uh, University of Toronto under the advisor of Young Bak Kim. Um, afterwards, he owed a few postdoc positions, one at the Perimeter Institute from 2012 to 2015, and then afterward at Harvard University in the group uh, of Subur Shadev uh, from in 2015-2016. And then afterwards, we had the chance to uh, attract him as a professor at the University of Montreal since he's been in 2016 and now. Okay. Um, during that time, he owed, uh, well, he received um, a few uh, awards. Uh, let's just mention that he got uh, the Antwerp uh, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, as well as a few other, like uh, the Anne Molson gold medal at McGill University, um, and so on. Okay, so William, I will let you do your presentations and. Um, Um, do you want to be stopped if there are questions, or do you prefer the questions to be at the end? No, 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 it's bon. The questions can come when people have questions. Okay, so if you have questions, please raise your hand and I will uh, manage the, uh, the question. Okay. Yeah, ben merci, uh, merci, Michel. Puis aussi, merci, Andrea, d'avoir uh, oui. posé de mon nom pour la présentation. Um, So I'll give it the talk in English, but if you have questions in French, uh, feel free. Um, and I changed the title a bit you uh, did. compared to uh, what's uh, in the email. So I added uh, entanglement. This will be uh, maybe one third of the talk. Uh, it won't only be about fluctuations, but uh, there'll also be a discussion about coin entanglement. Um, so it's based on this work. So do you see my cursor, this arrow that's moving around? Yeah, okay. So this is a recent work that uh, just appeared uh, in January with my French colleagues, Benoit Etienne from Sorbonne and Jean-Marie Stéphane from Lyon. Um, and this also connects to a lot of previous works we have done with people about entanglement. So people from Waterloo, Harvard, um, France, Europe, here. So that's actually one of my uh, favorite topics. So that's why it touches upon many papers that we wrote over the years. So the plan is fairly straightforward. Uh, I'll introduce what we mean by bipartite fluctuations, and we will look at different geometries. And we'll see that there is a certain super universality and the geometric dependence of the bipartite fluctuations. Then we'll move on to a much harder topic, which is that of understanding how the entanglement entropy, which I'll define, uh, depends on the subregion geometry. And we'll see that this, there is some quasi super universality, so a weaker form of universality, but nevertheless related to what we will see in section one and fluctuations. Um, and I'll discuss this intriguing link between the two. And we'll talk about a few systems. The talk is actually very general, but for the sake of concreteness, I'll be using the quantum Hall effect as the main test bed, both uh, integer and fractional versions of itself. So. Alrighty. So section one, fluctuations. And this is something that uh, you know, we all know and love, 
irrespective of whether it's classical quantum physics. So fluctuations, uh, people also call that variance. In, in quantum mechanics, we call that the uncertainty and an observable. So let's say we have some observable O. So the variance, fluctuation, or uncertainty on that is simply the expectation value of deviations from the average squared. So if you expand this, you get it's the average of O squared minus the average squared. So that's a relation that appears, for example, in Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. But here I'm being agnostic about the expectation value. It's not necessarily quantum mechanical. It could be uh, in classical physics, some distribution. Okay. So it's not only about quantum. This could be purely classical, in fact. And there people call that the variance most often. In science, we often deal with local observables. So O in some anybody system is some local integral. Okay, so integral over space of some density. Most common in condensed matter is electric charge. You could also talk about the energy density. If you're in biophysics, you could worry about the density of bacteria and so forth. So once we have a local observable, we can ask a more refined question. So instead of looking at the whole integral of your whole system, one can look at the integral over a subset of your system. Okay. So the question is, what are the fluctuations or variance of an observable over a spatial subregion A? That's uh, we're going to call that subregion A. And so OA is simply the integral of this density, like charge density over a subregion A. Okay, spatial subregion. So here is an example of a square subregion in red. And AC is a complement, it's just the outside. So the rest of the system. And now things become richer because you know your fluctuations will depend on the shape of A. Okay. So let us try to see how far we can get. So we start with the, the fluctuations of OA, so the uh, integral over A of this uh, density. So the variance is the average of OA squared minus the average squared. Um, and this you can just rewrite as this double integral over A of the connected correlation function. Okay, so it's just the average of rho r times rho r prime minus the averages of rho r times the average of rho r prime. So that's the connected correlation function. So once you know this connected correlation function and you perform this, these two integrals over A, you will get the fluctuations of observable O that's restricted to A. And now, yeah, just, to, just to be clear, the C that you have here has nothing to do with the A of C. Yeah? No, C means connected here. C means connected. Right. Connected. That's right. So it's maybe it's bad notation because it's not. Just to make it clear. Case. Yeah. Because we integrate over A, in fact. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so to make some progress, because right now, you know, you can't say very much about this. Um, to make progress, let's focus on translation invariant in isotropic states. Okay. So. It still leaves a lot of room open, but it's we, we have more symmetry, so more progress will be made. And we'll focus on scalar observables, so scalar and the rotation, like the charge density. Okay. So in that case, as we know, the connected correlation function is a function of the separation between the two points. So this two-point function is simply a function f of the separation between r and r prime. So now things are, are simpler, although F can be you know, very different and depending on the state you choose, whether it's a classical uh, system or quantum density matrix, you have still a lot of choices for F. And obviously you still have a choice for A. We haven't specified what kind of A we're gonna study. One point that we'll have to ask in this talk to have sensible answers is that 
f decays sufficiently fast at the large separations, which is a case for uh, you know, local um, observables in local systems. So usually this will be um, satisfied. Although we'll see some examples where things um, are not as local as we would like to. Okay. So now one can do actually uh, a rather general expansion of this fluctuation. So when the subregion A is large, so we have this following expansion, the leading term generically will be what we call the volume law. So we'll scale as the size of region A. So if it's in two dimension, it's the area of A. That's what this notation means. Okay, so the volume law just tells us that the fluctuations are often extensive in the region. Then the second term in the expansion will often be the boundary law. Okay, and this will only scale as the size of the boundary of A. So not the interior, just a frontier of A. So in two dimensions, it's the perimeter of the region A. That's a notation here. And beta is some coefficient. And then there's a the rest. Okay. But let's understand first these two coefficients for the, um, the volume, bulk, and boundary laws, alpha and beta. So the leading coefficient alpha, we can actually very simply obtain that it's the integral of this connected correlation function over all space. And this is simply the Fourier transform of the static structure factor. So the structure factor is the Fourier transform of the connected correlation function f of r. And when you put k equal to zero, so at zero wave vector, you recover the volume law coefficient. And sometimes this S of k, this static structure factor, is also called a susceptibility. So depending on which observable you're considering, charge, magnetic, and so forth. So that's this leading coefficient. So if this is zero, then you don't have a volume law. The next coefficient is the boundary law. And this one is, is more intriguing. Um, so in our paper, we give this very generic formula and any D spatial dimensions, it's this integral over, so R now is the modulus of the distance. So it's the integral of R to the D. So in two dimensions is R squared times f of r. And if we were we write this in terms of the static structure factor, you get that it's s of k over k squared that's integrated over, over all k. So this depends on the entire structure factor. So it's, it's not some uh, small wave vector information. This is actually um, what we call very microscopic information where you need to know the full k dependence of the static structure factor to get this boundary law coefficient. And the fact that the boundary law coefficient is this very microscopic quantity that depends on the entire information at small and large scales, this is something that will also have, uh, that also appears when you look at the entanglement entropy. The boundary law also in that case is microscopic quantity. It's not a small, uh, small wave vector property, okay? And if we look at, for example, a conserved quantity, like the charge density, okay? So at t equals zero at very, or very small temperatures, you don't have a volume law because charge is conserved. So the fluctuations are not extensive. You can only have fluctuations of charge if the charge crosses the boundary of region A, you know? In that case, there's no volume law in the first term in the expansion is a boundary law. So that's what dominates charge fluctuations at zero temperature for any other conserved quantity in your system. So these, the first one is not very interesting because it's very simple. The second one is very microscopic. So it's not a low energy property. So let's see what hides in the remainder. We call this minus B. And that's where the interesting physics is hiding. And here to make some progress, we have to pick a geometry because otherwise it's hard to say some very general things, although one can say some very general things about this remainder, but for this talk, for concreteness, now we're gonna pick a family of geometries, okay? 
So we're going to pick these pie shaped geometries. So they have a corner. And this corner is interesting uh, for a few reasons. For one, this geometry, so if you imagine this pie shape extending to infinity, it's a scale invariant uh, geometry. So the only parameter that enters is the angle, and that's a dimensionless quantity. So there's no size per se in this subregion. You can also fill the plane with copies of this pi, assuming it has uh, an even, uh, not even, but integer multiple of two pi, or a rational fraction of two pi. Um, as I said, it's parameterized by a single parameter, so that's that makes things simpler. And also, it's important because it's relevant both on the lattice and in the continuum. Because on the lattice, you know, defining like smooth shapes like you know discs or ellipses is actually not convenient because you have to pixelize these shapes because in a square lattice, a disc doesn't match naturally uh, the square lattice, and this leads to complications when you compute various quantities, whereas a square subregion is entirely natural on a square, la square um, lattice. So that's another region, another reason why these polygons are very uh, important geometries is because we often work on the lattice and that, in that regime, you always kind of have corners. And here I'm actually showing, um, just to explain this, this, this figure, because it's actually non-trivial, it's the uh, it's a typical electron distribution in a fractional quantum Hall state at filling fraction one third. So we'll come back to this. Uh, this has, uh, has about 50 electrons, uh, it's a quantum Hall droplet. It's a strongly correlated system. And we'll be using the system to understand how the fluctuations depend on the angle of this pi, pi corner. All right, so that's the setting. And now it turns out we can go quite far with this information actually. So with this corner geometry and this spatial symmetries, rotation and translations, that is enough to fix everything essentially. Okay. And so I usually don't go into such details and talks, but here is so simple. And the answer is also so simple that I think it's worth going over this slide and a half to see how to simplify to get a final answer. Um, so you take the fluctuation, which we want to study, and we subtract the, the volume law. That's very simple. Sometimes there's no volume law. And this volume law subtracted fluctuation, I'm going to call that capital theta A. So that's the quantity we want to study. And in fact, we want to isolate the remainder. So one wants to remove the boundary law contributions. And it turns out this, there's this nice linear combination of geometries that does that for you. So that let's look at this A, B, C, D subregions. If you take these four combinations of fluctuations over A, B, so A, B is simply the half plane. A, B is the lower half plane. A is this red pi and C is the opposite pi. This combination actually removes the boundary law coefficients and you're left with something that directly gives you the remainder, which we're hunting after now. And the integral you're left is no longer this double integral over A, but now it's integral over B and D. Okay. And so now there's only one point where R can equal to R prime. And so this is good because when R equal to R prime, things often diverge or can diverge. And here, this is only limited to this to the apex of these pi, these pies. So, but that's still not very transparent. It's still not obvious what that is. I mean, I haven't specified F, right? I haven't specified what kind of system we're studying this in. So there's a two changes of variables one can do. Um, so first, I'm going to change variables from R prime to minus R prime. So the integral now becomes, instead of r minus r prime, r plus r prime, OK? And then I'm going to switch to polar coordinates for both variables, r and r prime. So 
r is r times cos phi sine phi in the plane, and same for r prime, but d prime the variables. Okay. And now there's a trick. So that's the key trick to simplify the answer is I'm going to introduce new color coordinates. Yeah. New William? Color coordinates. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your previous uh, slide, it's I seen that you change the uh, the uh, volume or you or the area where you integrate, or as you change a variable, you go from B to D. See, there was like B and D, and then right. one, you have D D. Yeah, because we changed from R to okay. R prime to minus R prime, so that's also D that's D also changed the. Yeah, that's also changed the uh, the area where you integrate. B to D, yeah. So the minus, because we send R prime to minus R prime. Mm -hmm. When you do that, region B becomes region D. So now you integrate over twice region B, but now it's R plus R prime. Okay, good. Just one, yeah. The reflection um, will be in R goes to minus R uh, yeah. transformation. And so now that the only real trick is this one, which is not entirely obvious. Um, we're going to change to new polar coordinates, but only using the radial variables R and R prime. So R and R prime are, are the positive moduli of the distances. And so they're both, you know, R and R prime together um, to live in the top right quadrant and introduce a new polar coordinate. So S is a new radius and omega is a new angle in this top right quadrant. quadrant. Okay, so omega goes to zero to pi over two and S goes from zero to infinity. Okay, so this is a change of variables where we're going to change from R and R prime to these new S and omega variables. So when you do that, you get that the integral over D and D becomes this one, actually. So what's important is what's in F, OK? And so in F, there is this new radial coordinate S, and then there is a square root that involves the angles. So this new polar angle and the two previous ones, phi and phi prime. But now we can simply rescale the angle dependence. So define a new radial coordinate, capital R, that is the previous one, S times the square root. OK, so now the new radial integral is just dr r cubed f of r without any angle dependence times some you know, weird looking angle integral. And it's not obvious, but you can actually evaluate this angle integral exactly. Um, and if you do so, this is the answer. So <laughs> it's this, this very simple function, one plus pi minus theta times cotangent theta. Cotangent is cosine over sine. Okay, so that's it. And the radial integral, I haven't done anything with it because we can't, we don't know what f of r is. But this does not depend on the region at all. It's just an integral over this connected correlation function. So the entire dependence on the shape of the region has been evaluated and is this for any system that has these properties. Okay. So this is what we call super universality. So this could be classical fluid, it could be a quantum Hall state, it could be a quantum critical system. Some excited state, some thermal state, you know, almost anything you want, as long as it's translation and rotation invariant. Classical quantum could be bacteria, could be whatever. And so the prefactor is the only thing that you need to evaluate once you give me your state. Um, so this function is actually. No, not only simple, but also natural. So let's understand some limits. That's what we want to do in physics always. So at small angles, when the pi corner becomes very <clears throat> pointy, you know, like a needle, 
this thing becomes very large because cosine over sine diverges. Sine theta goes as one over theta. Um, cotangent theta goes as one over theta. So this diverges as one over theta. And this means that uh, the correction to the boundary law is very strong in that limit, okay? which is natural because fluctuations are very strong in such a narrow region. You know, the particles can move very easily out uh, of the region. In the opposite limit, where the angle is almost pi, if there's no corner, then there's no corner contribution. This has to vanish. And that limit, when the angle is almost pi, is non-singular. You know, this corner function vanishes. Um, nothing special is happening. And so if it's non-singular, it vanishes. It's some integer power of theta minus pi. And in this case, if you evaluate this, it's theta minus pi squared. So it's an even power of theta minus pi. And we'll see this dependence appearing later on. Um, yeah. Francois has a question, yes. Yes, uh, it also diverges if uh, f of r is a function that goes, uh, that uh, doesn't go, uh, it, it has to go at one uh, over r to the, the minus four, uh, one over r to the four yeah. for the integral, not to, uh, or if more than four actually, for the, the, uh, the integral not to blow up. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll come back to that. It's important. Actually, four is fine. In fact, four is the limiting case, and it still works. But if it's above four, this whole analysis actually um, is no bueno. It doesn't work. You get a new dependence, and yeah. But for most systems, four is um, log divergent. Yeah. So when four, it's log divergent, and that's very important. And we'll come back to a class of system where this happens. When it's above four, then these are not as uh, as nice. And does it make any sense to go to two above pi? Like two pi doesn't you know? It's, oh, can the angle be two pi basically? Yeah. So I mean, um, if the angle is two pi, it's the entire a is the entire system. Yes. And so you don't have any corner contribution. Right. Um, but the limit, because if we go back, so um, sine vanishes at two pi, it's divergent. So it's the same as having very small angles. Taking the whole system is the same as taking no system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, there's this complementarity between this very sharp limit and the entire limit. Okay. So in fact, in this function, if you know what happens between zero and pi, it's a reflection to know what's between pi and two pi. Mm -hmm. It's only information, but you can look at angles that are above pi. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yes, that's the angle dependence. And we call that the corner fluctuation function for obvious reasons. And the rest, what's interesting now to understand is this prefactor is r cubed times f integral, okay? And now this actually probes long wavelength limit of the static structure factor, contrary to the boundary law. This is a low vector, a low wave vector property. It's a long distance property of the system. Why? Because if you rewrite this in terms of the static structure factor, so it's drr, that's the measure, over the plane, and then it's r squared, f of r, r squared is nice. It gives you the second derivative of the static structure factor evaluated at k equal to zero. Okay, so it's the coefficient of k squared at small k in the static structure factor. So that's a nice small k property, long distance. So something that uh, is robust in many systems. And so this is advantageous compared to the boundary law, which doesn't have this nice uh, low energy property. Okay. So now we have this nice formula, a bit abstract. Let's test in a few systems so that we can chew on something concrete and understand this divergence that can happen in many systems, in fact, when the dependence uh, is like one over r to the four 
or beyond. So the first test is a quantum Hall effect. It's a very important system uh, for many people. And it can be realized in many platforms and experiments. Here I'm showing um, two DEG, a sandwich of semiconductors on the right with the appropriate terminals to measure the Hall connectivity. So the idea is to sandwich a gas of electrons or holes in this heterostructure so that they're confined effectively to a 2D plane. And then you apply a very strong B field transverse to this plane. Okay, so in the limit where the field is very strong and the two deg is rather clean, you can see interesting physics. Otherwise, you still see nice physics as a classical Hall effect. So Lorentz force. So if you drive a current in the X direction and the B field is like this, the Lorentz force will generate the transverse voltage and the Hull connectivity is simply the ratio of the current in X over the voltage in Y. That's the Hull connectivity. So that's classical Hull effect. But in the regime where B is large enough, T is small enough and your sample is you know, sufficiently clean, although it doesn't have to be that clean, uh, you get what we call the quantum Hall effect. And in particular, you can have the fractional quantum Hall effect. So let me tell you a bit about that state because it's very interesting. So if the filling fraction has, takes some interesting values like one third, the filling fraction is the um, electronic charge density N over the B field times the Planck's constant divided by electron charge and absolute value. That's what we call the filling fraction. So it's just the density over the B field. When this takes value one third, for example, you get a state that has very interesting quasiparticles. If you take the state and you create two such quasiparticles and you imagine exchanging the positions of these quasiparticles, you get a funny phase for the many body wave function. It's not plus minus one as you'd expect for bosons or fermions, but it's e to the i pi over three. <laughs> so that's what we call anions. So these are quasi particles that are not bosons nor fermions, but they're somewhere in between. They're abelian anions, and the exchange factor is not e to the zero or e to the i pi, it's e to the i pi over three. And this is possible because of very strong Coulomb interaction between electrons and this low temperature regime. Okay, and this has been observed in two DEGs. And it's an example of a topological phase of matter. So it's e to the i pi over three, and it's not 3.1, it's not 2.99, it's exactly three. And that's a topological invariant of this many body wave function. So it's perhaps the most important example of a topological phase of matter, the fractional quantum Hall state. Uh, at least three Nobel Prizes were given, not the three people, I mean, three distinct years of Nobel Prize were given for the quantum Hall effect, most recently the Haldane, um, because these phases are fascinating. But one thing that's also very important for applications is that the Hall connectivity itself becomes topologically quantized. It's in terms of the charge electron squared divided by the Planck's constant times nu, and nu is its filling fraction. And so here's a plot of the Hall resistance versus B field. So they keep the charge density fixed and they sweep the B field to change the filling fraction. And they see these beautiful plateaus where the Hall connectivity here in this first one at the top right is one third times E squared over H. It does not depend on effective mass of the two DAG, on temperature, on purity, on the B field. No, it's really in this plateau, it's quantized to one third times E squared over H. In fact, it's a way to measure E squared over H. In fact, it's the way to measure E squared over H. Um, in physics. That's how precise this quantization is. So here's a plateau at one. I didn't encircle this because that's the integer quantum Hall state. This is non-interacting physics. But the ones that I've encircled are the fractional quantum Hall states where we have anions. So one third filling fraction, two fifths, two thirds, 
which are three nice plateaus in this data from Stormer, but you see many other filling fractions where you have plateaus. That's a quantum Hall effect, beautiful, beautiful physics. For quantum Hall states, it turns out we can evaluate this integral that gives you the corner dependence of fluctuations. You know, the, we need a coefficient of k square and the static structure factor. It turns out that for any, and now we're gonna, we're gonna focus on the charge density as our observable. So charge density is the observable and any quantum Hall state you want at any filling fraction you want, as long as it's incompressible. So gapped quantum Hall state. At small k, this is what you get for the static structure factor. K squared times the filling fraction itself. That's it, plus higher order terms. So the second k derivative just picks up new and there's one over four pi. The reason is because of symmetry and the gap. So this is a nice paper by you know, my colleague, Paul Wigman from Chicago and company. And they say that the leading term, and I'm quoting, the structure factor does not depend on a quantum Hall state. It's a consequence of conservation of particle number and angular momentum. We're assuming infinite system that has rotational symmetry. And then they talk about the next two leading coefficient, which is not that universal, but for the first one is very simple. Even for fractional quantum Hall systems, one third, you put one third. If it's integer quantum Hall state, you put one and that's, that's it. So we can make a prediction for any quantum Hall state for this corner term of the charge fluctuations. It's just filling fraction times our nice super universal function, one plus pi theta, pi minus theta times cotangent theta. And if I take natural units where E and H bar equal to one, this is simply the Hall connectivity time, times this corner function, okay? One test is for nu equal one where you can solve this without Coulomb interaction. So it's an undergraduate problem. And this has been solved by my colleagues. It's in and Stefan. This matches exactly what they found analytically. So that's one check done, but it's a very simple check. So we wanted to check for fractional quantum Hall systems. These are very strong interacting electronic systems where the Coulomb interaction dominates the kinetic energy impact. So uh, Laughlin gave us these beautiful wave functions. Okay, so this is the Laughlin wave function um, in a family of fillings. And we're gonna be interested in filling fraction one third for electrons, but also one half for bosons. This cannot be realized in two DEGs, but could be realized in cold atomic systems or in simulations or with spin systems. But if you care about electrons, just focus on the one third. Okay, so that's what corresponds to the nice plateau I was showing you in the Stormer data. So this many body wave function for you know 10 to the 23 electrons captures this anion physics in fact. And Laughlin got a Nobel Prize because of that. He had the wave function, but it's very hard to extract the physics when nu is not equal to one, because it's not a Gaussian state. It's not a single slater. It's many slaters. <laughs> and this just kills you when you simulate things. So you have to resort to approximate schemes. And uh, Jean-Marie Stéphane is an expert in Monte Carlo simulations. So we can actually sample the charge fluctuations over any subregion using Monte Carlo simulations. And that's what he did. And so we used this geometry. So we put about 50 electrons in a quantum Hall droplet, okay? So the electrons stick together in this droplet. And then we took a pie-shaped region of angle theta. And Jean-Marie was able to push up to 48 particles, which is very difficult. You know, I couldn't do it. It took many uh, CPU years on a cluster. Um, and that's a typical configuration that you get from uh, this Laughlin wave function at filling fraction one third. And there's some subtleties about edge effects and removing the boundary law, but these were overcome. And you get the following plot. So Jean-Marie also checked the integral Hall state at filling fraction one, just as a benchmark, because that we know the exact answer, it has to work. So just to check the Monte Carlo, he did that. So he did filling fraction one, one half, which is this bosonic FQH states and one third. And he plotted the corner fluctuation term divided by the filling fraction. And now that's independent of anything. 
in these quantum Hall systems. It's the same function for any quantum Hall state. And in fact, he found perfect collapse for these three filling fractions. And so that, that was convincing for us. <laughs> um, this is, you know, the final answer. And, you know, I mean, the, the noise is extremely small in this. I'm not even going to care about the, the error bars here for, for this observable because 48 particles in one whole states for this local observable is just sufficient. So that's, uh, that's one exact confirmation using Laughlin wave functions. And we could also do other wave functions, non-abelian quantum Hall wave functions, which are definitely uh, more difficult and richer, but I have no doubt that one will recover uh, the same answer. So we didn't bother. Uh, Philip? Yeah, but maybe you, you just answered, but I was wondering, um, now you look at fluctuations and this, this must be true for any types because I did any types of observable because I didn't see any constraint on, on, on what, what type of observable. So, well, we actually required the observable to be a scalar under rotation, so invariant under rotation. Yes, 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 okay, so yes. Velocity, sure. velocity, you know, like current, current would not work because current is not a scalar under rotation. So that's- So uh, electronic density, for, for example. Yeah, electric okay. density, which is what we're looking at. That's- Yeah, uh, yeah, did this understand, but if, if you had any other scalar that's observable right. that is translation invariant, yeah. then- but, the question there is maybe we don't have the answer for the structure factor at small k for generic systems. Okay. For the charge density in quantum Hall states, it turns out because of symmetries in the gap, we have this very generic results that it's k squared times the filling fraction for any quantum Hall state, including these, uh, the one with the anions that fractional fillings. For our other observables, we don't necessarily have such a simple answer. I understand. For the, str the static structure factor, but in principle. But provided that you had it, for example, I don't know. I'm sorry? Provided that you had it by some mean, then, right. then you, could, you could scale like this. Yeah. Okay, I understand. thank you. Second test, because that, that's, that's ground states. Maybe I didn't mention is this is the ground state for quantum Hall states. But this is very general. I mean, this, this would be true for thermal states, excited states. So we looked at a simple excited state at filling fraction one. So this is a Gaussian state, no Coulomb interaction. So, so you fill one Landau level entirely, okay? But instead of filling the lowest Landau level, that would be the integer from Hall state, you fill an excited Landau level. That's an excited state. It's a highly excited state. Um, so, you can treat things very simply. And when you evaluate the corner term, you also get the same corner dependence. And the prefactor is now no longer the filling. The filling is one. So this should be one over four pi for ground state, but now it's not four pi. It's two n plus one, where n is the lambda level you're entirely filling. So the larger n, the more excited the state is. Um, and it's reasonable that this corner prefactor grows with n because higher excited states, the electrons in that state move a lot, so to speak. And so you expect the charge fluctuations to be larger as you excite the state more and more. And that's what you see here. So that's one test for excited states. But as I said, it could be a thermal state, anything you want. But here, the prefactor we can evaluate rather simply. Another test that we did is for quantum critical systems. So systems that are, for example, at a phase transition or in a gapless phase, like in graphene. These systems that we're going to look at are called conformal field theories. So these have nice symmetries and they arise in many contexts in condensed matter. For example, in the Ising model at the phase transition or the XY magnets at the phase transition, it also describes some phases of um, frustrated quantum magnets where you can have emergent fermions. That would be quantum electrodynamics with massless direct fermions. It could also be just vanilla graphene that's been simplified. That would just be uh, non-interacting direct fermions at charge neutrality. That's one example of a conformal field theory or CFT. And again, let's pick an observable that's uh, a scalar in a rotation. So here I'm going to take charge density again. 
Okay. So think about charge density in half filling graphene. In the ground state, you can show based just on symmetry, it's very simple that this connected two point function in real space is just one over R to the four. Okay, and this power of four is protected by symmetry, by scale invariance and this emergent Lorentz invariance. The prefactor is all you, that you need to compute for a given theory. This gives you the strength of these charge correlations, this connected correlation function in real space. And in fact, if you want to think about other observables, this coefficient, which I'm calling CJ here, in fact, gives you the longitudinal connectivity of those gapless systems, like in graphene. Okay, so sigma xx, not sigma xy, this is the longitudinal connectivity is just this capital CJ times pi squared over two. So essentially, it's the connectivity over R to the four for those systems. So if you put this f of r in our relation, so the prefactor now has a problem, as we noticed earlier, because r cubed over r to the four is one over r, and this is divergent at small distances and large distances, gives you a logarithm. But that's fine, in fact. That's the answer. So the answer is that you have this logarithm that scales with the perimeter of your region, so the length of the boundary around A, divided by delta, where delta is some short, short distance scale in your system. If you're doing field theory, it's a cutoff. But if you're doing, if you have a microscopic system like graphene on a honeycomb lattice, this will be the lattice spacing between carbon atoms. It's not important, in fact, because whatever delta is just pollutes the constant term. The prefactor of the logarithm is protected. Um, and that's nice because this means that the prefactor is in fact universal. It's not dependent on this short distance length scale, which there are many in a system. Which one do you choose? It doesn't matter in fact, okay? Because the prefactor is simply the connectivity times this universal corner function. And so you do have this log enhancement in gapless systems because fluctuations are stronger when you have a gapless system compared to a quantum Hall state where you have a nice gap that limits how much things move, including charge. And before I take questions, uh, you can say, well, you know, maybe you were too fast just applying the formula. You can use different methods to evaluate the, uh, the variance of the charge on a polygon and you get this log enhancement. So you always get this log enhancement for gapless systems. So the gap closing, the fact that you don't have a band gap in the system leads to enhanced charge fluctuations. Um, Michel. You, in your formula, you have the, uh, the, the length of the perimeter, but in your setup, this is infinite. So why, why is that causing a problem? Because in this case, there's a divergence. So you can't really make it infinite. In this case, you have to cut it off at long distances. Okay. But it doesn't matter how you cut it off. That's the point. You can put like, you know, you make a pie and then you can finish with a disc, finish with a dinosaur shape, finish with anything you want, as long as it's smooth. Mm -hmm. no? There's no corners because then you have to add contributions from the corners you're adding. Uh, it will not affect the corner okay. contribution. So you just need any length scale that tells you the size of your subregion. And in experiments, if you measure, you know, bacteria in a subregion, you always have a finite region, and so that would be the perimeter. <clears throat> but the logarithm is very important; it protects you. So it could be twice the perimeter if you want, or five times, or only the length of one side but it will not change the prefactor of the logarithm. Okay. It just tells you that there's a, the charge fluctuations grow as the perimeter of your region, as the log of the perimeter, mm -hmm. which is not the case in gap systems. So without a band gap, you have more charge fluctuations. Not so much more, in fact, in the systems, because it's not, these are not metals. These are semi-metals, like graphene. It's charge neutrality. Mm -hmm. So it's still not the most you can get. So you have more fluctuations, 
but it's only log enhanced, right? Log is almost nothing. Right. So it's almost like a GAT system. <laughs> um, so one over R to the four uh, gives you this uh, marginal case, this log. So now let's talk about metals, because metals is a less fine-tuned system. So graphene, but not a charge neutrality. If you detune, so whole dope or electron dope or any metal, and I'll take copper or whatever. Does this work? Well, not really. Let's see why. Okay. So remember, we, we want rotation invariance. So the Fermi surface, the simplest one, is a single circular Fermi surface. You can break that, but then the talk becomes too long to explain everything. So let's just focus on this simple two-dimensional metal, dope graphene, ideal graphene, electron dope, for example. Uh, that's a Fermi liquid. Okay. Um, and at, for any Fermi liquid, so an interacting metal, this connected to point function in 2D at large distances decays as one over R theta three. It's essentially what you get from free oscillations, but free transform into real space. Um, and so one over R to the three now decays very slowly at large distances. And this is stronger than a log divergence. So, but let's go back. In fact, before looking at the corner term, let's just look at the boundary lock coefficient for any region, any subregion you want to pick, you know, a square, a disk, whatever. Let's see what happens for the boundary law. Do we still have the boundary law for metals? Well, the answer is no. So the generic formula for the boundary law is the integral of R, R squared times F of R. That's true for any system. So if you put the one over R3 in this formula, you get the log divergent contribution to the boundary law. So the boundary law coefficient is log divergent. So you have a log enhancement to the boundary law. And this, ha this has been known for some time by, um, for example, Geoev and Klich. They showed this uh, exactly for non-interacting systems, uh, non-interacting metals, that you have this log enhancement to the boundary law because metals have very strong fluctuations because you have an entire Fermi surface wort uh, of gapless modes. Each point at KF is a gapless mode. And so this recovers the result of uh, these people for the boundary law. For the corner term, Things are more subtle, in fact, because since the decay is very slow, you can't really isolate the contribution from a single corner. Say you have a square or any other polygon. This corner contribution now becomes more of a global thing that depends on how many corners you have and um, the angles of the different corners. But you can use some tricks to evaluate some corner function. And we did that. And you find that a corner term now is not log enhanced, like in graphene at charge neutrality it's linearly enhanced. So it scales very strongly. So it scales as not as the log of the boundary, but as the length of the boundary itself. Okay. And the angle of dependence is very complicated. This is for non-interacting metals. You have, uh, you know, this Li2 is a poly algorithm, which is some uh, special function. Anyways, it's, it's not so easy and it's not so universal. But this is an example where things break down when f decays too slowly at long distances. That's where our super universal formula does not apply, as advertised earlier. You know, we had this red warning. And so charge fluctuations in metals is a case where it doesn't work because it decays too slowly at long distances. Okay, that ends <laughs> almost my talk, but uh, I've been going a bit too slowly, but very, um, a bit faster, I'll talk about entanglement now and the connection between this simple quantity because fluctuations are very simple. You know, we did the calculation essentially live, right? This integrals, the manipulations. Uh, so that's very simple, but it's not our ultimate goal. Well, my ultimate goal, for example, would be to understand the entanglement between A subregion and the complement, the outside, and how this depends on the geometry of the subsystem I measure. And that's an important question, which tells you about um, the structure of entanglement 
locally, you know, how does a given part entangle with the rest of the system? And this is very rich information. Uh, it's a non-local non -local property about the system. Um, and so this is much more difficult to evaluate. You cannot write this in terms of an integral over a local density, okay? So how do you measure entanglement? There are many, many measures, but at very low temperature, there's one that's uh, most natural and that is provably very, very useful. It's called the entanglement entropy, okay? And it's very similar to the fluctuations. So the point is that you give me a state and then you have to specify a subregion A, okay? And then I can give you what the entanglement entropy is for that subregion. So it's in fact simpler than fluctuations because I do not need to specify the observable. Just give me your system. Tell me it's a quantum Hall system. Um, it could be a classical system, in which case it's just a classical entropy. So that's not very interesting, but you could still do it. Um, so just give me your system and a subregion, and then I give you a number telling you how entangled A is, ent is with the outside. The way it works is you take the density matrix for the entire system, and you restrict it to a subregion. Okay, so this just means you trace degrees of freedom outside of A. Okay, that's a partial trace. And you're left with a density matrix that tells you about all observables that live in A. If you know row A, you can compute any observable that lives in A, including you know, point observables, like charge density at a given point. But it could be charge density in some subregion, which is more interesting. So any observable in A is uh, computable from row A. So now instead of thinking observables, I'm just going to compute to what degree row A is mixed, because A and the complement are entangled. So by tracing out the complement, I'm left with the statistical dis um, description of A. You know, it's no longer an exact description because I've traced out the complement which was entangled with region A. So now my description of A is no longer deterministic quantum mechanically. It's a classical, it's a mixed state generically, you know, like a finite temperature state, if you wish. And so to quantify the amount of mixedness or entanglement in row A, you can define the Rennie entropy, which is just, you evaluate the trace of row A to some power N, where N is an integer. So two, three, four, five, six, and data log and time this prefactor. When N tends to one, there's a special limit, you recover what we call the von Neumann entanglement entropy, minus tro trace of row log row. And this is a famous von Neumann formula for the entropy. Um, and so this quantity tells you how much A is entangled with the outside. If they're not entangled, then it's just zero. Okay. So now we can ask the same questions as for fluctuations. That is, to understand for corner regions the angle dependence of the entanglement entropy and compare that with the simple case of fluctuations of a local observable and see if things are similar or not. But it's just more difficult. So we cannot be as general in the analysis. So I'm gonna focus on isotropic and translation invariant ground states. So T equals zero of topological phases or quantum critical systems like charge neutrality graphene. Just for the talk, I have to be specific. Otherwise we will never end because it's very, very, very complicated. Um, we can also expand now this quantity as region A becomes large. So this large A expansion at T equals zero or very small temperature, we again have a boundary law. This is a very famous result. We have boundary law. So entanglement comes from degrees of freedom near the boundary of A. So that's not that surprising at low temperature. Um, and then you have subleading terms, which before we called B, now we call gamma. Okay, and you can have some topological contributions to gamma, which is not what we care about today because we care about the angle dependence. So we're gonna care about this red geometric contribution, which is the angle dependence on a pie-shaped region. Um, 
just as for charge fluctuations, the subleading term will be independent of the size of region A in this large A limit for gap systems. As for quantum Hall systems, we saw for charge fluctuations. This will also be the case for entanglement entropy. So you just get a function of the angle without any dependence on the size in a region A. For charge neutrality graphene or other quantum critical systems of that sort, or CFTs, you also have a log enhancement as we had for charge fluctuations. So it's a very similar case. What differs is this corner function, which we call A of theta now, instead of this one plus pi minus theta cotangent theta. We don't know what A of theta is in general. But the dependence on the geometry of region A is the same for these two systems. Um, okay, no, no, no. Um, let me just skip forward to examples of this corner contribution for the entanglement entropy for different systems. So here I'm showing many systems. This is based on many, many papers. It's very complicated. Like each system is one paper, essentially. That's how difficult it is to extract this quantity. So this corner term divided by some quantity. Uh, well, let me talk about this quantity a bit because otherwise it's maybe hard to uh, follow everything. So the corner function, when the angle becomes almost pi, vanishes as theta minus pi squared, just as for fluctuations. And the coefficient, I'm going to call lambda. So different systems have different lambdas. So to compare this entanglement corner contribution from different systems, I'm going to normalize by their corresponding lambda coefficient. So I'm plotting the corner function over this quadratic coefficient lambda, and the theta minus pi being small limit. So this is very different systems. Scalar CFT is a relativistic boson, if you wish, uh, acoustic phonon. Dirac CFT is vanilla graphene at charge neutrality. Fluctuations is not an entanglement. This is the charge fluctuations we talked about earlier. This line is somewhere in this forest of lines. They all sort of overlap. It's somewhere in there, this purple line. IQH is integer quantum Hall states at filling fraction one and two. And then we have quantum phase transitions in the Ising model, in the XY model, and Heisenberg model in quantum magnets. And these, we only have pi over two because the simulations by other groups were done on a square lattice and they could only access square regions. But you see that once you divide by this parameter lambda, all these curves are almost the same. So we have to zoom in because this is not fair. In this scale, things are almost the same. If you zoom in, there is some spread. Okay, so the range of angles and radians is from 0.6 to 0.85. And you see there is some spread. That's not errors. This is real spread. These are different corner functions. So you lose the super universality, but we say we have quasi super universality because nevertheless, these angle dependence is very, very, very similar between very, very different systems, but it's no longer exact. You do have spread, but the spread is not so big. And in fact, the dependence on angle is very similar to the fluctuation function, which we can now find is this purple line straight in the middle. That's the simple function, this one plus pi minus theta cotangent theta. And it's middle of this forest of entanglement corner functions. And we don't know why, because these two quantities have very different origins. One is a local observable, the other one is not. And so we don't understand why they're so similar to each other. There's no reason a priori. Open question. And so very quickly, I'm gonna present some new results on the entanglement entropy of fractional quantum Hall states. This was again using Laughlin wave functions as we saw before in Monte Carlo, but this time Monte Carlo is much more difficult because you need in fact two copies of the system. And for some technical reasons, you need two copies. And this gives you access, not the von Neumann entropy, but to the second Rennie entropy. This Rennie index is equal to two, and two is the number of copies of the system that you need to evaluate. But it's, it's a detail. S2 is um, entanglement entropy that tells you how much A is entangled with the rest of the system. And now uh, Jean-Marie Stéphane did these Monte Carlo simulations for these same two filling fractions, one half for bosons and one third for electrons using 
48 and 64 particles because this is not an easily converged quantity and you need to go beyond 48 particles. And even then you have some uh, error bars which are non-negligible. And that's the corner function that he got as a function of theta. So the lower line is one half, that's a bosonic FQ state. And the top line is the electronic one third plateau we saw in the Stormer plot, okay? Um, so one quick thing that's very different from charge fluctuations is that the one with the smaller filling fraction, one third, has a larger corner contribution than the one with the bigger filling fraction. For charge fluctuations, the corner term is linearly proportional to the new the filling fraction. So this should be inversed. The orange line should be under this red or purple line. But here, it's the other way around because entanglement is not as simple as charge fluctuations. So somehow a smaller filling fraction is more entangled than the one half filling fraction, which is opposite to charge fluctuations. So we already have one clear distinction here. And now we have two different systems, these two different filling fractions. So let's try to scale again with this lambda coefficient to put them on the same ground and to just look at the angle dependence. And so that's what we did here. We divide by this lambda coefficient. So lambda is the coefficient of theta minus pi squared when pi, the theta is, is near pi. And now you have that both the one half and one third FQH states, which are the blue for one half and orange for one third, almost away the same angle of dependence, but you have some spread. You know, there are at smaller angles, the difference is noticeable. Um, and this angle dependence remains though similar to the charge fluctuations, which is the green line here. It's hidden between these other lines, okay? So you still have a similar angle dependence as the super universal function for charge but the spread is different. And also we don't have as much confidence at small angles due to finite size effects for these um, fractional filling fractions. So more work to be continued, but we still have indication that there is some quasi spring universality at work here. Conclusion, we saw this very simple relation for any system that has variance under rotation and translations, and that decays fast enough at large distances, the fluctuations from corners will have this simple angle dependence, and the prefactor is just a low wave vector property of the static structure factor. We saw that entanglement entropy behaves similarly to this angle dependence, but has deviations. So we don't know why it's so similar. That's the question that's open. Deviations are expected. What's not expected is that it's so similar. And to test that, we obtained new results using fractional quantum Hall states, where we saw that this angle dependence does describe entanglement at leading order, but you have deviations, but it's still similar. And so natural generalizations are to other dimensions, like three dimensions. This talk was in two dimensions in the plane, but you can generalize things to higher dimensions. We talk about this in a paper a bit. Um, and there are upcoming works about higher dimensions. You can also generalize to observables that are not scalars and to systems that are not isotropic. Things become more complicated, but you can do something systematically. Maybe more interestingly, you can do experiments. So one experiment that I would like to try is to uh, count bacteria in subregions and take you know, fluctuation of the number of bacteria in region A, that's your observable. And see, for example, what you would get for the boundary law coefficient and what you would get for the corner contribution. So that would be fun using, I don't know, like E. coli or something that's long enough lived. Uh, you can also count galaxies if you wish. You have to adapt the formula to the sphere, but it can be done. Or you can count cold atoms. Anyways, it's many options, and then understand entanglement and why it's so similar to charge to, to uh, these, um, not charge only, but observable fluctuations. That's an open question. Thank you for your attention and sorry for going a bit long. We had a few questions in the talk, so I feel a bit less bad. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, and this nice uh, talk.
Very nice work. So my my uh, uh, just a dumb question. Uh, so so when in the Monte Carlo, uh, the it was measured by doing this big theta a b plus big theta and so on. That's the way it was measured with the Monte Carlo. Yeah, no, I don't think so actually, um, because so let me show you the quantum pulse geometry for Monte Carlo. Because there, so here, there we have um, a system which has a physical boundary in effect. Because in a quantum pulse system, having a finite number of electrons means that you form this quantum Hall droplet, the finite radius. And so, as we know, in a quantum Hall system, we have chiral modes that go around the physical boundary of the sample. Or in, this case, the boundary of the quantum Hall droplet. Um, and so in this case, you also have a contribution coming from this chiral mode to the charge fluctuation. This contributes because this chiral mode also has is charged. It's a charged mode. It has fractional charge in the FQH state, but it still has charge E over three. And this contributes as well. So I think Jean-Marie did just for a single region, theta, but then we know for this observable, the contribution for this mode, you can evaluate this using um, known facts about the Luttinger liquid description of the boundary mode. And we also know the boundary lock coefficient, or he was able to extract it numerically and then remove it. Although he could have done, as you say, this combination, you know, A, B, B, D, minus A, minus D, I forget exact. Um, but that was, I think, a bit too costly. So it turned out that subtracting was numerically uh, simpler, I think. And hopefully I don't forget, because as I said, I did not do that analysis. But I know that the new contribution there is the boundary mode, which if you think about infinite pi shape, you don't have that, that contribution, whereas here we have it in a finite size system. So, but with the bacteria, what experiment are you proposing? It's really to you compute these big data? Yeah, so take a square and then take a triangle. So you have two different angles. And I would, you know, before even, before looking at angle dependence, it would be good to see the stronger terms like volume law and boundary law. So there's a volume law if bacteria die too fast. But if you sort of do experiments in a time scale, your measurements where the bacteria uh, on average are conserved, then you wouldn't have a vo volume law contribution. You would only have a boundary law contribution coming from bacteria that move across the boundary of region A. So my first test would just to measure the boundary law coefficient for a given type of bacterium under given conditions, you know, maybe temperature or you know the amount of food in the soups in the substrate increases or decreases the boundary law coefficient. And then as a secondary question, one could look at two different geometries, a square and a triangle, to, to see the angle dependence. If you're if you're interested, let's say in the for example, in the long wavelength uh, behavior of the structure factor or something like that, isn't it better to just measure the structure factor or is there an advantage in measuring these quantities? Right here, you related the, the, this coefficient to... Yeah, exactly. No, in this case, I mean, it's you get the same information, right? So uh, if you want that information and the experiments of measuring the structure factor for bacteria or like the net analysis <laughs> is simpler, then that's sufficient. Um, the boundary law coefficient, though, is not a simple low wave vector property of the structure factor. So for that, you cannot really, it's, if you get the full SFK, then you can do the integral and get that. But maybe doing the experiment on different <laughs> regions and counting bacteria in different imaginary regions, maybe it's simpler for bacteria, I don't know. Um, because here, the question is not about what's simpler to get the structure factor. The structure factor, we don't care about really, right? Because it's a simple quantity. Uh, what's interesting is that the angle dependence for any system for the fluctuation 
does not depend on a structure factor. That's that's what was our interest in this quantity it was not to get the structure factor. That's a simple quantity that you know, as you say, uh, other experiments perhaps are simpler. Um, for us, it was to understand how fluctuations depend on the geometry of the subregion, and that's a stepping stone to understand how entanglement depends on the geometry, which is a much difficult, much more difficult question, which right. doesn't have any connection with uh, local scattering experiments or mm -hmm. local measurements like row row correlation function. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's not about uh, the simpler way to get the k squared coefficient, but it's it's more about a different way of measuring correlation functions. Yes. No, it's a very nice uh, idea, and it's, it was far far from obvious that it would be universal, at least to me. I mean, it, well, we, we didn't anticipate, in fact. Uh, so I have to say that we were going to this uh, blindfolded. We didn't think this was super universal because why would it? I mean, when you start with general f and the angle integrals, it's all nasty and it's not obvious. Right. But somehow, yeah, very nice. I, yeah. Thank you very I mean, much. The, historically, what happened is that we tried with different FQH states and we found the same angle dependence. And then we're like, well, okay, then it probably has to be provable. And then the proof we realize is very general. I see. But we didn't prove yeah. first. We first did numerical experiments on Laughlin states. I see. Very it's nice. like Laughlin discovered fractional charge by playing around with Laughlin wave functions. <laughs> Yes, actually, he, uh, he just uh, he told this story at one point that he he just opened a book on uh, on helium and he saw this Castro function and said, okay, why not try this? So, yeah, <laughs> sometimes things happen, right? Yeah, with a few electrons, right? I mean, he was doing very small size uh, analysis, right? And was able to get yeah. us insight for fractional charge, right? Okay, thank you very much. Very nice. That's all we yeah, so basically, instead of uh, doing a complicated experiment to get the entanglement entropy, you can count bacteria. Is that the point? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> well, so there's no entanglement for bacteria. No, no, um, but it gives you the same. Like emergent bacteria, quasi bacteria. Yes. But the point is that, okay, so. Uh, entanglement is difficult to measure. In fact, there's no easy way to do it uh, for materials, right? Yes. But we're saying, yeah, pick an observable and try these measurements, and you'll get something that maybe, for you know, maybe will behave the same way as entanglement in your system. Okay. Uh, it's like a first step, you know, because that is something you have access to. You can measure things locally, uh, you know. It's not so easy, always, obviously, for uh, solids. You know, like you take a chunk of copper. How do you measure charge in a subregion? Uh, not so easy. <laughs> yes. But uh, at least conceptually, you know, as a Gedanken, it's far easier than measuring entanglement entropy, where yes. you need to have two copies of your copper and have some swap operator between them, as they do in the collatum experiments. And that's like, okay, forget about that. Um, so, so, yeah, our advice would be to start with some observable you can measure and see how those fluctuations depend on the geometry and this can give you insights about entanglement in that same system although it's not guaranteed because um, there's no theorem in general but it can give you insights okay thanks good i think there's no more questions all right, so join me to um, thanks uh, William for this talks. And if you can open your um, your camera so that William has a sense that he's talked to real people for a while. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there you go. You. you got real people watching you, William. Yeah. Thank you all. Glad to see you, people. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde.